Um, I wanted to thank you so much for joining us today as we dig in on the important issue of regulatory coherence in the EU-US trade agreement, um, TAFTA, as we have called it in the US, uh, or TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, as it is officially named, and many of you may know it by. You probably know that the vast majority uh, of estimates for this trade deal's economic benefits uh, come from tackling behind the border or technical barriers to trade. And that both the EU and the US have acknowledged that reducing these costs to industry, so the costs of having different systems of public protections in the EU and the US, is one of the most important and most challenging aspects of these trade negotiations. Um, it is also clear that negotiators recognize that they won't be able to deal with every um, issue in this agreement, uh, in these negotiations. Some things will take too long, some things will be too politically sticky, uh, and some things our regulators and, and those in the EU uh, just haven't regulated yet. Um, so negotiators would like to set up an ongoing institutional framework to deal with regulatory divergences down the road. Um, this chapter on regulatory coherence is about dealing both with future uh, regulation on emerging technology such as nanotechnology and about a review and adjustment of existing legislation, implementation of that legislation and regulation. Uh, this is so that sectoral dialogues uh, can skirt around the sticky issues um, just by putting out substantive proposals that can then be dealt with down the road through even less transparent and democratic processes. Uh, I, will, I will be speaking on uh, regulatory cooperation, um, an issue that we started working intensely on uh, last year. Uh, late just last year, when we discovered that uh, the European Commission, uh, that is the European negotiators, um, were in an int intense dialogue with uh, with the big business community, not not just about um, a regulation in particular sectors, uh, but about uh, long term procedures um, uh, that they would want to set up to iron out uh, regulatory divergence. So that's that's basically basically what the regulatory cooperation is about. It's about um, uh, procedures that will um, allow um, uh, the U.S. authorities and, and the EU to to work on uh, on regulatory divergence uh, in in the future after an agreement has been signed. Um, why is that uh, becoming an increasingly important issue in in the European Union? I um, I would have to say a few words about um, the um, uh, the political debate on the TTIP in in Europe at the moment, um, and the um, the political difficulty that uh, the negotiators are, are facing, and it has a lot to do with uh, with the European Parliament and and with the public debate. Um, the European negotiators are faced with, on one hand, their own need to conclude a very comprehensive uh, agreement. And um, and um, um, the demands from uh, from the U.S. and from the European business community to um, uh, to reform uh, the European regulatory system to make it more uh, suitable for for more trade with with the U.S. on the one hand, and then on the other hand, um, they are dealing with an in, in, well, more and more uh, critical voices, including from uh, from the the political body that will have to approve any deal with the U.S. Uh, in the end, that is the European Parliament. Uh, in the European Parliament, um, which gladly um, 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 approved the, the negotiating mandate about a year ago, uh, more and more um, concern is being voiced uh, um, about um, the, the fate of uh, protection levels. And the European Commission has uh, been forced, I would say, um, to, uh, to, uh, to give a lot of bold promises that the, the, the agreement will, in the end, uh, not affect uh, protection levels. We will not give in on, uh, on, uh, on, on chemicals regulation, on our food standards and so forth. I, I don't think, looking through uh, the EU document, and I will say what, what's in it in a minute, 
I don't think we should look for for presidents. I, I don't think we should um, look much into what is going on on the on the NAFTA. I believe that, um, uh, that what the negotiators are going for is something that uh, does not have uh, a president. Uh, indeed, that's what they're saying. I, I heard uh, an EU negotiator say uh, about a month ago uh, that this was, uh, well, first, this was a key issue of the negotiations, and second, that they were in uncharted waters, that they were doing something that um, no one had really done before at the at the international level. U.S. side or some sector-specific things, um, particularly with the financial sector being one high priority area for the European business interests. Um, they also are really keen to have um, disparate parts of our system brought under the rubric of TAFTA. Um, so at the federal level, you may recall that I talked about our executive agencies. We also have what are called independent agencies that are not directly accountable to the president. They're really uh, accountable at the end of the day to Congress. And they don't have the same um, all of the same burdens that I, that I described. And the European proposals are clear they want to have those same set of rules apply to the independent agencies. And the other thing I think the Europeans are especially keen on, and this relates to the previous question as well, is ensuring that U.S. state law is subordinated to, these same, to the same kind of processes that Kenneth was describing. Um, it's a big concern, at least it's long been a big concern in European trade documents that our that our states don't follow um, all the rules from the federal government and, and may have disparate standards in a lot of ways. Um, U.S. companies object to that, and so do European companies. And the Euro I think the European proposal aims in part at trying to address that issue. Not really. The only, the only thing that I would might additionally say is to underscore what Kenneth said earlier, which is in this area more than others, um, the negotiators are plainly making this stuff up. So it's all speculative because, uh, partly because we don't know what they're proposing, but also I don't think they know what they're proposing. And they're, it's, much more, it's a much more fluid conversation than in, say, an area like intellectual property where they're basically going to conform to what they do in other deals. Um, in this one, they're trying to do things that are novel. I don't really think they know what they're doing, actually. Mm -hmm. This is another overlay to adopt um, processes that make it harder to have rules that protect uh, the public and that make it easier for corporations to undermine those rules. By and large, the regulators do want to do what their agency's mission is. Um, and this deal is in large part about stopping them from doing that. So they have an incentive in trying to slow this thing down, at least getting it under control. And I think if we can at least get them up to speed on what's going on. What will happen in the future if we have both an ISDS and we have um, an early warning mechanism uh, on the, the uh, system of regulatory cooperation? Because an early warning me mechanism means that whenever, um, whenever, say, the Commission gets a good idea for a new regulation, it would have to consult with the U.S. and 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 indirectly with uh, with or directly with uh, with U.S. businesses. If there's an ISDS in place, that would be the moment when um, uh, businesses on the other side of the Atlantic can use ISDS to threaten the Commission if um, the the uh, the proposal in question would be um, against their interests. So I think, I mean, one of the things that could make uh, regulatory cooperation extremely dangerous is, is when you see it in, in combination with, uh, with the ISDS. The real thrust of it is around regulatory policy, and as we've been discussing, a much more intrusive invasion into the, the regulatory policy side of, of, of the rich and powerful countries than we've seen with either TPP um, or other U.S. trade agreements.